two, three. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Greater Sydney Landcare webinar series. This is webinar number nine, and we're joined by Tom Covell from Hooked on Nature. Tom's going to be telling us all about the amazing animals we have living in our urban and peri-urban bushland throughout Greater Sydney. First, I'd like to start by acknowledging all the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all joining from tonight. I'm on direct country myself. I'd like to recognise and respect the elders past and present. We also want to acknowledge and respect the continuing culture and contribution that's made to all the lands of Australia as the traditional land carers. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us tonight. So we're joined by Tom Cavell from Hooked on Nature. Tom is an incredible ecologist. He's got pretty much encyclopedic knowledge of all the flora and fauna um, in Greater Sydney and, and beyond. Um, he's also a guide and a videographer. So he makes pretty impressive videos and he's got some footage to share with us tonight too, so pretty lucky. Um, Tom's enthusiasm for nature is really infectious, so I hope you enjoy the presentation. Before we start, there is some housekeeping. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen that you can click on if you have any questions throughout Tom's presentation. Just click on that, type in your question, and we'll get back to that when Tom's finished talking. All right. Thanks very much, and I hope you enjoy. During the period of COVID, I've been out creating content for local governments about wildlife specifically in reserves. And I thought the best way for me to go about showing you what's in the reserves is to show you a video. So I'm just going to see how this goes. See if I can. All right. Can you all hear that? <laughs> Now, all this wildlife has been shot in reserves around Western Sydney. And I'm not actually talking about national parks. These are parkland reserves such as Parramatta, where these water dragons were taken. These lorikeets were at Lake Parramatta, nesting in one of the hollows there. And so were these native bees, these, these stingless bees, tetragonula. And believe it or not, this echidna, this was at Lake Parramatta as well. Fruit rats, eastern long neck turtles. Rush turkeys. Sugar light is actually I filmed in Parramatta as well. Vineyard in a fruit in a reserve called Vineyard Creek. As was this tawny frog mouth. Brushed up possums. This is me light trapping, trying to catch moths and insects. Amicia, amazing bull ants. Yeah, short fin deal. The water skinks. This is some of the work I do with kids, getting kids out catching bugs. Oh no. This is a Sydney River Park. Lopia. Parajong. It's the only thing that wasn't in Sydney. Um, however, I've seen lots of butterflies. This is Yellow Valley Glider from the private property in Colorado. All right, so can you all hear me still, everyone? Yep. Yep, now um, the reason I wanted to show you that video Oh, it's still playing again, stop. 
the reason I wanted to show you that video is all that wildlife, bar that platypus, that platypus was actually shot down in southern New South Wales. However, I have seen platypus uh, in the Nepean River just up from the weir right in Penrith. And I wanted to highlight that, 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 that wildlife to you because our reserves are teeming with life. And it's really important for, for animals, but it's really, really important for us. And so my talk today is, is going to be about us connecting through urban reserves. So I've prepared a little bit of a presentation to show you. And I'll just get this going. Okay, hopefully this works. Now, I'm a really big lover of Richard Louvre. I don't know if anybody's heard of the book, Last Child in the Woods. This is one of his quotes, and this was me to a T. Nature really was my riddle. I had used nature for my mental health escape. It completely um, absorbed me. It was where I was catching bugs, chasing lizards, and it, it actually gave me focus. And I bring this to the attention, and tonight's talk's really about conservation through us getting into these reserves, because I feel one of the biggest threats right now, including habitat destruction, is the fact that people just aren't connected to the natural world. And that's what I do for a business. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Bricker, she, he, you can see her quote, she's talking about experiences and, and, and how people are moving further and further, that they don't have the same contact and intimacy with the natural world. And Richard Louvre has coined the term nature deficit disorder. And so talking about that, my story really does start with me being a kid. I was that kid that was always outside and I was catching things like this, blue tongue lizards. This was my pet blue tongue as a little boy. Um, I would have been four or five there and I did the wrong thing. I caught a blue tongue in my garden. I mean, that would be considered illegal now, but at the time I think it was a very formative experience and it taught me so much. And it was my real big hook into the natural world. And it was my lead into science. I wasn't a good kid in terms of, I was very bad at reading books. I didn't learn to read stories. I learned to read encyclopedias because as an older boy, about 12 years of age, because I was interested in the natural world. And I was very fortunate to be surrounded by a group of people. I know this is a terrible photo uh, of people that were good mentors. The person there on the left of your screen, Ian McEwen, I know he's very pixelated, was an old man who brought me into bush care and I was, as a little boy, this is, oh, geez, going, going back almost 20 years ago now, uh, doing bush care in the Hawkesbury uh, for my parents. And so I've always loved the natural world. And nature for me taught me so much about the requirements of wildlife, so the need for habitat, life cycles, how just, just individual actions have impacts, the, nat the jobs that nature does for us, you know, key things ecosystem services but i do like to say nature does jobs for us everything from pollination through to pest control and those living requirements it, it helped me develop it also introduced me to death and and that's something i think is very important in our society you know i had pet animals die i saw my chickens eaten by a fox for instance and they're really good lessons i learned about reproduction from a young age i remember being a little boy and breeding my axolotls and so all these sort of things were, were key life lessons and it really focused me into science. And so romantic idea as a young, young teenager, um, I thought I wanted to become a scientist specifically in biology. And I had a number of jobs to being a zookeeper. And then I really nestled, nestled into my studies and I actually became an ecologist. And then I found myself working jobs like bush regeneration and a lot of environmental education. But I thought I needed a real job. And so I took a job with Penrith Council and I was a biodiversity officer. And basically that's an assessing officer who assesses development. So I look at threatened ecosystems, development's gonna happen and use the legislation to say what's permissible and try and get the best outcome for wildlife and plants. And I'm going to have a lot of shots of wildlife in here, but I'm actually really an ecosystem person. I love complete ecosystems and that's what we need to protect. And so here's me, idealistic, working for council and realising that the legislation isn't very strong. Um, you can work under state or federal legislation. In fact, I worked under both uh, the EPBC Act and uh, the TSC Act and then the 
Biodiversity Conservation Act, so Threatened Species Conservation Act, Conservation Act the Biodiversity Conservation Act, which was state, and um, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, the, state, the federal legislation. And it's all good and all trying to get the best outcomes for developments. But what I kept coming across is people just had no connection to the natural world, didn't realise the, the magnitude of their impacts and what was being lost. And therefore, they didn't know about it. They were less likely to care about it. And I know money is ob obviously a huge driver with this. And today, we, you know, we're here talking about land care and, and restoring ecosystems. But first and foremost, before we restore an ecosystem, we've got to have people wanting to care for them. And I was very disillusioned. I was probably drinking too much red wine and, and uh, not in the best place mentally. And I'd already started my business, Tom's Environmental Discovery. It was before I, I added, changed the name, sorry, to Hooked on Nature. Uh, but I, I, I had my heart set on being an ecologist. And so I did that for a number of years. And working in Penrith, you can see here, we've got land use map here. And it, it's so intensively used. We're in Western Sydney and in Greater Sydney, we are just, we're at the forefront of biodiversity loss. It is debated. The ecosystem I'm very passionate about is the critical endangered Cumberland Plain. And it's hotly debated how much is left. I, don't, I would say it's most likely under 5%. Um, some authorities say it's still over 10. I don't believe it is, but that, that aside, it's incredibly fragmented. And it's very hard to calculate what's being counted. And so you can see here, this is, these are the ecosystems of Greater Sydney, the Cumberland Plain, and just how much has been lost. And where it's remaining is, is actually these urban reserves. So our urban reserves around Sydney um, are just beautiful little, little islands or ships of, of vegetation that's critically endangered. It's found nowhere else on the planet. And it doesn't afford the same protection as other ecosystems because it's not Borneo rainforest. It's not green, it's not lush, it's brown, it's crunchy, um, it's not England. <laughs> and therefore it's often perceived as not having much value. And it, the reason is so threatened is following uh, European settlement, it was the first area cleared for agriculture and now it's our homes. And it's just been hugely impacted upon. And the areas you will notice that are often afforded a bit of protection around Sydney, and especially the Blue Mountains, talking about the Blue Mountains National Park, Karingai, uh, the Royal, uh, Wallabai, all these national parks are actually situated on sandstone. And sandstone is low fertility soil. In other words, it wasn't cleared because it had no value to agriculture. And uh, so that's why that's left. It's not, it's got nothing to do with it just being pretty, unfortunately. And so, with these critical endangered ecosystems, specifically the Cumberland Plain and those being reserves, there's a really hard thing going on. Now, tonight I'm talking about getting people and especially kids out into the natural world. And I'm showing you this slide because a lot of the land, the Great Cumberland Plain, some of it's on private property. And I know this isn't Cumberland Plain here. This is actually the Hawkesbury River next to, uh, at, at Windsor. You just can't get access to it. It's on private land. And so kids aren't actually getting the opportunity to get into these landscapes as easily other than their urban reserves. And so we've got a real hard thing here with these urban reserves. You've got this, this land that is very endangered, has wildlife, you know, critically endangered and threatened plants and animals. And yet it's also the playground for lots of kids and so there's a bit of a disconnect here. There's a, there's a dissonance where we want, I want personally, or I need, and I think it's essential to development if we, want to, if we want to foster future conservationists, kids to look after the natural land, they need to have access to these landscapes. Um, but we also want to protect the species there. So we have to try and find a medium. And it's, I don't have all the answers, but I do think we need people in, in it because if, they, if they're not in it, they're not going to care for it. And that's the key thing. And so working at council and I already had my business started, I got to the point where my mental health was suffering with, with the, the amount of biodiversity loss and what I couldn't stop. So my partner said, Tom, you're mad. You love doing these nature tours. Why don't you follow your heart and um, 
really get stuck into your business. So that's when I really threw my heart and soul into my company, Hooked on Nature, and it's all about connecting people to the natural world and specific reserves. So what do I do? I get kids out there and families and all ages. I've taken 80-year-olds out, out into the bush and I get them just immersing themselves in and around the local environment, showing them our life. You're going to notice that I have lots of things without backbones in my slideshow. And the reason for that is lots of the life, in my opinion, uh, is the insects and the spiders and the mollusks and the plants. It's really fascinating when you get down close and personal. In fact, before today's presentation and those crazy storms, I went out with my big bug net and I went and got, I don't know if you can see that there, a whole heap of insects. So this is a, one of my Tupperware containers that I use. And you'll- hey, Tom, if you, if you stop sharing your screen and then that one comes up bigger. Oh, yeah. Actually, if I stop, I'll stop sharing my screen. Sorry, guys. Okay. Apologies. So, one tick. See, I told you I'm computer illiterate. Too much time in the bush. So if you can see here, this here is teeming with insects and spiders. It's absolutely full of life. And what I've done is I've gone out with my trusty bug net, big kid still, taken a few sweeps of the grass. And when I say a few sweeps, I literally mean a handful, like five, and ticked all the contents in here. And it is full of life. And it's a great teaching opportunity because there's little spiders in here, there's wasps, there's all sorts of things. It's a little bit hard for me to show you all. And all these different little souls are playing different roles, whether, whether it be the spiders catching mosquitoes, you know, putting their webs up, you know, like a big filter. Some of the wasps in here um, are great pollinators. Others have got these zombie life cycles where they lay their eggs inside of caterpillars. And in fact, the other day, I was in my veggie garden out the front and I had a cabbage moth larvae that I, was, I brought in to feed one of my ants. And all these cocoons erupted out of its body and it was a, um, a parasitic wasp. And I show this stuff to people, I show it to kids, but I show it to adults as well. And they just love it. They don't realise this life's out there. And that's nature doing jobs for us. So it's all this life. And that's what I do. I go out and show people it. Now, I'm just going to go back to the share screen. And so a lot, of my, a lot of my business is getting people out there. And this is a reserve in the mountains. It's tiny. It's in turpentine. And all these kids are out bug hunting. And for me, that, that warms my heart. And I'm doing it because I'm trying to really foster that connection. I'm trying to let people know there's actually life out there with the hope that if people start realising the life and these insects and the birds and the bees and, and the snakes and the spiders and and the plants, um, and I know I've talked a lot about animals, but the plants are crucial to everything else, but importantly us, we're the human animal in this ecosystem. And by us being immersed in these, reserve, in these reserves, I'm hoping with a bit of guidance that we can really realize our place in the ecosystem as a species. And I love what I do. I'm out there every, you know, many nights a week uh, before COVID and uh, showing people stuff. And actually here we're looking at um, some insects, uh, some big, sorry, big, not insects, big, big huntsman spiders up on a cave. And light trapping, I'm here catching little insects. There's just so much out there. Most people would miss it. This is at another reserve. This is in the Hawkesbury. And what I found is everybody loves it. Now, I'm telling you all these things today, and it's not about massaging my ego. I'm actually telling you because I want you to go out there and do the same thing. I want you to take people out into your local bush because everyone on this, on this webinar tonight is the converted. You love nature. You're raving about this habitat. This is, this is the thing I go on about. You, you know what we need. What we need, though, and I, and I really believe this, is I want you to get more people out there. Um, I'm hoping from this talk tonight that I can hopefully inspire you to talk to neighbours, family, and take people out there with a torch or get kids bug hunting and try and foster that connection to the natural world with the long-term hope of making future conservationists. Because 
my biggest fear, and I'm, I'm going to reiterate this point a few times, is as people are locked out of natural areas, as they're, they're kept away from them um, because you know, of damaging things. And that's it has to happen in some places. Some places are just that endangered. But some of these places, some of the urban reserves, if we don't have kids out there engaging with them, they're not going to fall in love with the world. And I think that is a critical threat to the future. And a lot of my work is about reducing anxieties, reducing anxiety in nature. And I work a lot with spiders. In fact, I brought Ruby with me. I'll show you Ruby in a minute. I know that Shane's brought Ruby with me, one of my spiders to show you later. Some of my other work is I do a lot of video work. That's my dad on the left. He's a professional filmmaker. He's recently retired and now I've employed him. Poor, poor man doesn't get a break. And he's a huge hero of mine. He teaches me so much. And right there, he's actually in this, where you can see me with a camera, I'm actually videoing a powerful hour, which you saw in the video just before at Parramatta or Vineyard Creek at Tilopia rather. And another one of my colleagues, Elliot, who's, who's a great photographer and he helps me run a lot of my nature walks and um, shares my passion for the little things. Everyone wants to see big things like possums and eagles and I, I do get excited when I see them, but there's so much of an interest in life when you look at this, the small lives. Another part of my work is creating habitat. Uh, this is a prototype frog hotel I made for a council and to my parents' veranda. My mum likes things that are aesthetically pleasing and I've deliberately used plants that aren't native here to show that they still have habitat value. Um, and yes, I do often use native plants, but these guys, these parents' tree frogs actually moved into that hotel. And that's the same one you can see there on the table. And we've been out there drinking, drinking Chardonnay on a hot, summer night while the storms are rolling in and the parents tree frogs calling from inside that bamboo and that's them emerging and i also make habitat to install into into different places and and get kids watching watching homes for wildlife and this was a uh, an iron bark that a neighbor felled uh, next door to my place in north richmond because the tree was dropping leaves and branches and doing what trees do and apparently that was too much of a nuisance and they didn't recognize the, the home value to all the other lives uh, so I repurposed this for sugar gliders. And that's it. We all need habitat. And so habitat comes in many forms, from hollow logs, huge trees, to a toilet bowl if you're a green tree frog. And that was that was in Western Sydney in a um, in a uh, like a, an oval toilet. Now nature, getting kids out there. This is really key stuff. Um, on the left, you can see a crazy wasp. It's been taken over by a parasitic fungi, fungi that's erupted out of its body. It's, you know, it's part of a life cycle and kids love that stuff, more of the zombies. And then he, she's actually a captive frog that I used to work with when I was taking animals into schools that I was feeding it a mouse. And I know it sounds gross and a bit confronting, but that's the fascinating stuff. And if people can recognise that these, these animals and these plants are doing jobs, they're more likely to conserve them talking about those ecosystem services. So here's a, 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 um, a wasp, little potter's wasp. They're great around my garden because they're, they're hunting caterpillars. And a little jumping spider on my back veranda, actually on a hoya, uh, eating a annoying house fly that has been pooing on my ceiling, lots of flies. Had to repaint the ceiling of our house. So by getting out of nature, you start realizing all the requirements for life. If you understand what animals need, water and food and you understand yourself you understand how you're more intimately connected to these ecosystems reproduction i think there's good lessons here this is um a common scene on many of my walks after rain like tonight the love the love season for parents tree frog and it also allows me to talk about death and threats now you can see there on the left of the screen i've got a really sad sight this is a powerful owl it's actually in my freezer and it's about to go to bird loft australia for analysis um, tragically at the moment and especially with the uh, plague of mice that we've seen in western new south wales we've had a lot of mice in this region as well and the mice have been eaten by birds of prey like um, things such as barn owls boo book owls a powerful owl in this instance and it's building up in their body and it's making them really prone to things like car strike and tragic. And so talking about options here of managing pests with nature and how someone's just throwing chemicals at it, it's doing more harm than good because we're, we're eliminating those predators, which is 
setting us up for failure in my opinion and i get to talk i, I get to talk about other things like here we've got a, a gray-headed flying fox that's wrapped around barbed wire really tragic scene my partner's a vet and i see a lot of this coming to her clinic so enough of the doom and gloom i just wanted to show you some of the little gems uh, around western sydney this here is a flying duck orchid and you wouldn't know why it's called that name i love these orchids amazing life cycle they're pollinate they let off a pheromone that smells like a sawfly and the male sawfly comes to mate with an orchid that's my understanding please fact check me and uh tell me i'm wrong that's what i love on my walks i get humbled all the time by people and uh that's how they pollinate so there's some really interesting things western sydney's alive this is a, uh, a bull man. Most people don't like them, especially with land care and you're doing regenerating things and you're kneeling on their nests. But she's a fascinating ant. These, these ants are only found in Australia and New Cal Caledonia. They're more related to wasps. They're amazing for our tree health because they go up in the canopy, they hunt insects, they paralyze them with that stinging tail, not with those big bulldog vice grip mandibles that have got their jaws. They actually sting them. They drag it down to the nest, they feed their larvae, but they themselves have got a sweet tooth. So they drink nectar from flowers and they're a pollinator. And they're all girls, they're all hard workers. This is, uh, I shot this in uh, Penrith when the bushfire's on. A top knot pigeon, a fruit eating pigeon. And they're really key for dispersing, dispersing rainforest fruits. And there is a bit of rainforest around Sydney and people, people don't expect to see things like this. This is actually at uh, Penrith Lakes along the Nepean River at the back. My favourite. Uh, big diamond python and I uh, encountered not so many of these on the Cumberland Plain but where the sandstone they're definitely out there and you know we're talking about that hour before pythons and snakes in general are a fantastic mouse control I like to call a brown snake a big long tube that goes down rat mouse holes and eats rats and mice so it's about that nature doing jobs for us and telling those stories it's the little wolf spider eating a Christmas beetle I took this shot uh, in the local park one night. This is on a sporting field, just on the side. Leaf green tree frog, Victoria phyla crower. They're stunning. You know, these, and when I'm walking on my walks and I see these things, it's just by slowing down and keying senses in. And these are skills we're not, we're, we're losing because we're not spending as much time in nature. This is at Penrith, tawny frog mouse on a nest. Awesome. I love hearing their woof, 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 woof calls. They're, they're starting to court. There's been a lot of them around, but they too, just like the other birds, well, they're not a bird of prey, but like birds of prey uh, are having issues with rat, back, bat, bat bait, uh, infected rodents, and they're eating them, and they're also coming into harm's way. This is from last year. This little turtle actually is something that I incubated. Its mum had been hit by a car. She survived, and she laid the eggs at the vet clinic, and we incubated the eggs and let them go. Just a stunning little face. And turtles are something in Western Sydney that need a lot of help. Uh, and, and that goes for the east coast of Australia and the southwest coast of Western Australia or coastal regions. They've really been heavily predated or eaten on, eaten by foxes. Foxes are nearly getting all the nests. The turtles you're seeing in the wild are old individuals. And so I'll get back to that in a second because I think at the end of my presentation is an important point in thinking about these animals, what you're seeing now. One of my favourite at the campsite, a lace monitor and uh, a great consumer of dead things and removing the smelly things from our, from our, around our, around our homes and they really do come into urban areas. Something I used to see all the time as a kid, uh, and this was actually on my parents' property at Kurrajong. It's an eastern bearded dragon and I grew up with these being the thing I was always on a quest for, go out and catch them and take photos and I love them, fascinated with it, with an eastern bearded dragon and just don't see them anymore. They too, are, I believe, are having issues with foxes getting a lot of their nests. They, they don't have the same numbers. And this here, a, a blue band of bees. Um, they, these are all boys and they're sleeping on a wind chime on somebody's house, which I think was an environmental education center. And um, they're all just clamped there. This is at nighttime. Another parent's tree frog calling. Uh, you've got a badge huntsman here eating a little amber tail cicada. On a Bessaria. Bessaria is this spiky plant in Western Sydney and a bird protector. You know, this is that brown, crunchy landscape and just look how diverse it is. There's so much out there. Like this green grocer, which freshly emerged. Um, this wasn't in Western Sydney, this was at Bilpin, but nonetheless, still stunning. And they were coming out fantastic last year where you couldn't hear yourself. 
and this is on a dog path or a bike path. Uh, and this was around Blacktown and this little lawn beetle, this African lawn beetle, I think it is. It's got a heap of hitchhikers on it, a lot of little mites. And these are the things people just don't get to see. You know, they ride around on the back. And this is our Castle Hill, Fred Catterson Reserve. It's got a street light behind it. And it's actually ghost fungi, bioluminescent fungi. You know, we're, we're, we're not the Amazon, but we still really glow. There's a lot out there. And these are long-jawed spiders. This is actually a, a love scene. Two long-jawed spiders mating. And I was taking a photo. Um, very, very lucky to have seen that. Longhorn beetles. They're an amazing beetle. They bore into trees and create habitat for our solitary trees. And they also help to rot timber, which reduces loads for, for fires and, and does all amazing stuff. What we do, I think this comes to the crux of why I love my business. We can share our knowledge uh, through experience, experience and story. Uh, we, as I keep, I'm going to keep saying, we're, we're the converted here. We're out there in nature. We care about it. We're land care. We're, we're passionate. But not everybody in our family is. Not all our friends are. But show people. Take the kids out in the backyard. Tell stories of intimate things. Um, and sometimes the sad stories, but also tell the good stories. Tell the, tell the wild stories. Tell the stories like... Myself, uh, seeing a brown snake in my chook pen as a kid, um, eating mice profusely from underneath a little slab of concrete and it trapped them under there. Take your family out into nature. Uh, you know, teach and learn through organisations, things like land care or bush care, volunteering, mentor young people. I really think mentoring is a key thing. But the next point I think is really important too, and this is what I'm getting about, access to the natural world, nature play letting kids get into nature and play. And, and this is, might sound a little bit controversial and please challenge me when we have time to talk after this. But when kids go into the bush or into a reserve and cut down a couple of wattle trees and make a cubby, is that really the threat? If they're out there loving nature and building those forts, as I did as a kid, I definitely did that. That's, you know, they're really formative experiences. And I've said here, fight for our reserves. And I think we really have to. Reserves are becoming parklands more and more and more. Lawns, a couple of native trees, they're feature trees, no connectivity, you know, long grass, grasses with snakes. You know, this is that anxiety about nature. And fighting for our reserves, I think, is, a, is, is really key. And one way we can do that is through those stories about the nature doing jobs for us, but also going out there and recording what you see, record the species that, that makes harder for things to happen because when I say record, I mean iNaturalist, I was living in Australia or Frog ID app or, or um, birds in backyards. Those things are really, really important. And oh, terrible when you see a spelling mistake, comment on your developments. When you see a development going in, a, a DA or a rezoning, fight for natural reserves please submit things it does have an impact on councils and taking your family out this is my this is my partner's kids taking them out bush into northern australia and just they got to experience some some wild wildlife and that'll be with them for the rest of their life and they don't have the same fear and kids that get exposed to this stuff aren't going to be the especially in the case of men young 17 year old or 19 year old boys with bravado and a shovel cutting off a snake's head you know, teach them respect and understanding. And yes, I know these animals were probably a little bit stressed being held, but I tell you what, they weren't harmed, they were released, and that'll be with these kids for the rest of their, rest of their lives and into their adult lives. So again, kids bug hunting, birds in schools, building habitat in, and that nature play, talking about forts. And I know this isn't in a reserve, this is actually at Centennial Park, but kids building cubbies earning connection to the natural world. Now, I've brought this up to show you, shifting baseline syndrome. I've got the bearded dragon there. We were doing surveys at Australian Botanic Gardens um, as part of a project. Eastern bearded dragons, I remember seeing lots of them as a kid. That's my baseline. As a child, I remember seeing lots, now I don't see many. And I think this, this meme on the right-hand side really sums it up with insects. Um, I remember being in the, the Commodore as a kid, and it covered in bugs and not seeing so many. What's going on? And people aren't going to 
get that baseline if they're not out there experiencing the natural world. And so a real big thing for me, and I think essential reading for, for everyone here, and if you've enjoyed some of the things I've said or, or haven't, but want to understand where I'm coming from, I think a great book to be read is The Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. And I think on the right-hand side, this, this little meme really, really sums it up. Parental fears. We don't want kids going out in the bush because the boogeyman's out there. Um, the snakes are going to get you. You're going to break your leg. You're going to get sunburnt. Um, heat stress. You know, there, are, there are risks and there are threats, but they're all manageable. And I think actually essential for people being raised as balanced people. You know, we, you know, restriction to natural areas, as we have more and more threatened ecosystems, I think the human animal is gonna have less access to these natural areas, which I think is, as I keep saying, is contributing to more threat because there's less understanding, less caring and not being aware of our role as a species. And that also comes with the consumption of electronic media. You know, everyone's on their phone constantly. And the costs, we are seeing anxiety in kids skyrocket. And I, I'm a, also an educator with um, the Sydney Olympic Park Authority, as well as with my own business going to schools. I see lots and lots of anxiety. Kids are stressed. Kids are chronically, they've got ADD or ADHD, um, obesity. And because they're not out in the natural world, they're having a limited respect. And, you know, I think it's, you've got to get kids and, and families and big kids out there feral. Let them go wild. But passion and curiosity, and curiosity is the key thing. So I'll leave you a quote with Richard on Louvre's quotes. So there's a few links, guys, to um, to stuff there. Oh, sorry, I know I've taken it down. We might better put that up afterwards. Okay. So I know I've got some some questions there. You're back, Bron. I'm back. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thanks for your I don't know how we're going for time. It's sort of hard to. Oh, a bit over time. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Um, yeah, there's a few questions. So if anyone has any questions about um, yeah for Tom, I don't know maybe. Some sort of animal that you've seen or any question um like that you can pop, pop them up i can go through um, i've got um judy harrington's left um mm -hmm. okay luke's just said Flannis? you had awesome footage yeah judy apologized and she's left and flannis has said he, you mentioned foxes um she lives next to springfield pond wetland near gosford um and she's caught some foxes on the wildlife camera many times it is an urban area that has a corridor to um, Rambalara Reserve. Council seems reluctant to bait anywhere near urban areas. Any wow. thoughts that might be helpful? Um, I hope you're still with us, Glenis. Uh, first of all, yep, as a as being, I've been in that situation where we're talking about baiting and land management. In urban areas, I mean, I've seen in the northern beaches of Australia and. Um, in the northern beaches, there's been a lot of baiting of foxes and it's seen a boom in brush turkeys and bandicoots and, and really beneficial things. Those two species are great because they're breaking down leaf litter and reducing fire loads. And it's hard. There's a lot of dog owners in those areas. Any thoughts? I mean, I think baiting in urban areas is really actually a good thing. Um, I think in national parks, I just like to see the reinstatement of dingoes. Dingoes as an apex predator really keep fox and cat numbers at low densities, which mean we have much higher density of those smaller animals like um, bandicoots and brush turkeys and um, all sorts of all sorts of wildlife. Well, um, that's a hard one. I think you can present facts to your council. You can try and get people on board, but you've also going to have come up against a force of people that really don't want to see dogs baited. And I can, understand as, I can understand that as well. I've seen that at my partner's clinic, dogs coming in with 1080 baiting and it's horrible. These dogs die. I don't have a good answer. I think, I think there has to be a strong education about and signage about keep your dogs on lead, which is a beneficial thing anyway. And I think 
in those urban contexts where you're not going to have dingoes, that baiting could be really good. Regarding turtle nests, there are programs now uh, I've seen quite successfully done in Victoria where they're putting mesh over the, they're going finding uh, broad shell turtles, which are like a, a long neck turtle on steroids, a huge long neck turtle. And they're putting mesh over the, over the nests, which stop the foxes and, and goannas as well digging into the nests and allows the babies to hatch. I, I don't know how well I've answered that, but um, I do think we need it. Okay, Bronwyn Sanders. I'm just going to yep. go. Cool. Um, and the next question is from Bronwyn. So Thank living you. just north of Penrith, my mother thinks she's seen a tiny gecko. Are there any gecko species um, that are from New Sydney, New South Wales? Yeah, there are. Um, there's broad tail geckos, there's um, thick tail geckos, or broad tails also known as leaf tail geckos. There's an eastern stone gecko, Lejua gecko. It's really hard to know. Um, north of Penrith, are they on sandy or soil? Are they on clay soil? Without a gecko, I can't, without a photo, sorry, I can't actually show you tell you what gecko is, but there's definitely potential uh, for a gecko there. One of those geckos. Okay. okay. Cassia. Yep. What conditions? Cassia. She are, said, "Thanks, Tom. What conditions are best for looking for frogs to observe?" Oh, right now, actually, and that's a really important point. Um, with that storm, we've had frogs are going bananas, and the time now is to go out looking for them. I brought my red torch. Uh, I use a use a white cap underneath, or so it's white underneath and then a red on top. It's a really it's a really handy tool. What I recommend you you do is go out in, and in urban areas and just use a white light at first and hold your torch up like you know Pinocchio torch and or big long nose. Hold your torch right in front of your face, just the way I am. Look around, you can see the frog's eye shining of a night time. So the best time to do it is after rain. You know the paths are still warm and steaming. Get out then. That's when you're going to see them. Uh, go to ponds. Sometimes if you go for a drive, you can see them on the road. They're the best times of looking for frogs by far. This time of year, it's great. Next question. Okay. And Sheldry just said, I have two parent frogs that have moved into an urn. Is the larger the female or male? And where will they uh, hibernate in winter? Okay, so they, I can't tell you what sex they are, I'm sorry. Females typically are bigger than frogs as a general rule, though I've seen some massive male uh, green tree, you're in Wollongong, uh, massive green tree frog males as well. But normally they're much, much bigger than females are. Um, yeah, they most likely will be in there in winter. They really will. And even if it dries a bit, I mean, if you can keep moist, that's a good thing. But I've seen them dry and the frogs are still fine. Uh, so yeah, it sounds like you've got a great little frog hotel there and a good piece of habitat. Yeah, she's just mentioned she lives in Wollongong. Yep, yeah. they'll, they'll be fine, that one. Okay. And Luke has said, do you have any tips on where to find good info on insect habitat? I, I do. I'd okay. love to direct my school kids where to find the info for themselves to make insect hotels. Okay, there's so many resources. I mean, there's... Um, What's it called? I'm having a mental blank, sorry. So find my bug. The CSIRO has got a, a whole key. If you type CSIRO in bug key, how to identify bugs really easily. Um, that can help you do to do that. There's lots of resources about making bug hotels. I've made lots of them with kids. And insect hotels are quite simply, you know, getting you can use, you know, bamboo, crushed bark, clay, all sorts of stuff. It's a deep dive. I recommend um, Going on to the CSIRO's bug key to identify bugs is, is a great start. I've got some good books that I love to use. But, I mean, the internet's your friend with this one, and, and I know that can be hard with kids, uh, getting them on the internet and keeping them on track. Uh, there's also Go Find a Bug. There's a good book. I believe it's called Go Find a Bug. It's a good introductory book for kids as well. Okay, great. Maybe what I'm going to do is after this, um, has finished, the video will be sent out to everybody who's registered. So I can send a few links out as well. Yeah, yeah. maybe. We'll Sorry, Luke. Tom. Right. Yes, I know. Link. Okay, Sandra. Hmm. All right. So Sandra said, so much damage has been done in my local bushland at 
Baronia Park Hunters Hill by young people building cubbies, bike paths through the bush. I totally understand as this was my introduction as a child. However, now as a bush regenerator adult, it's hard to see the damage done, especially to good bush um, with beautiful orchids and many different species. Um, I also fear for the black snakes who are emerging now. And she's just said help. Mm. Whew, yeah, um, since COVID, uh, where I'm at, I'm seeing exactly the same thing on one of my old bush regen sites too. And there's a fair level of damage uh, on the uh, the creek reserve, Red Bank Creek Reserve. Some of the army sort of good corridor. That's a hard one. I had a good example where I talked to BMX bike riders once and got them helping me do some planting one day and gave them an incentive on one of my sites once and tried to turn them around and maybe restrict their damage or limit the number of paths. There's no simple answers. I, I'm glad that you recognise that it's a, it's a good formative experience um, and it really depends on whether you'd want to approach them and maybe try and mentor in that situation, though that's also intimidating in itself. I don't think, you know, my, I know myself and I found myself becoming the banshee and, and getting really cranky it can be really quite destructive too because the kids end up going, oh, stuff, you were going to do it anyway. So maybe a conversation you can try and go, hey, guys, what are we trying to restrict paths to this area? And then, but if you can keep away from here because it's a really endangered plant and try and show them why it's so special. If you're talking about orchids, maybe you can talk about the crazy life cycle of orchids and the way they attract different flying insects using this different smell. They come down and mate with a flower and that's how the pollen gets spread. That could be one way of doing it. The thing, or the fear of black snakes, uh, as more and more people aren't doing urban bush and especially in COVID, it's like this double-edged sword. It's great to see people in the natural land and off, off a phone as much, but they're coming in contact with these animals and this is conflict. It gets down to education as well uh, and teaching respect. People people hate and kill the things they don't you know don't don't know or don't understand. And I, I think it gets back down to that conversation. We can try and maybe put some signs up and a positive sign, not just caution snakes. With a squiggly, squiggly emoji there, but but um, you know, we're, we're our friend snakes are out here and they're doing a good job of eating the rats and mice that come in your house. Please look out for them. Um, I, I don't know how else to really go about it unless you can see the kids that are regular and then try and have a conversation with them or their parents. And at the same time, if you see the parents there, then it's an even better opportunity. But I will say one thing if you can refrain from becoming angry and letting anger take over the conversation. And it's hard. I've got angry with people. I've, I've made that mistake so many times from passion. Uh, but if you can try and do that, I think that's the best way to approach it with looking for options and resolution and realize there's still going to be some damage, but the upside is they're getting some connection to the natural world. I, I hope that helps. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, I shall just mention there that there, there is water in the urn that her frogs are in the um, Perfect. Um, Sheldry, one thing you can do is you can put some gravel at the bottom too if you wanted to. So the water's in gravel. And the reason I say that is it reduces where the mosquitoes can breed. So it gives you a few less mozzies for you. And Sarah um, just said, thanks for an inspiring presentation, Tom. Uh, any tips on the areas I could access with my kids around Penrith Lakes? It was surprising to learn there is some rainforest habitat nearby. There's more, so there's like some Western Sydney dry rainforest, not right at Penrith Lakes, I'm more talking in the, in the area. Uh, that's more along the, the, the vegetation growing along um, Minipene River is quite, don't want to get too technical, but not quite rainforest, but thick and dense. And that's why those fruit pigeons are there feeding. But in other parts of Sydney, there certainly is. In terms of Penrith Lakes and where you can get them to play, you can. I would just go to the lakes, go and go and experience it. It's not amazing bush there, but go there and have a look. Maybe take a take a little uh, net with you and get the kids catching water bugs and looking at them. Bring a tray or one of these containers and tip it into it, and you can see you can see um, all the life that's living under the water. That's that's how I'd go about it. Um, there, there. In terms of bush that I think is really good to go and explore. Cuthro Nature Reserve, I think, fantastic spot to go out and see, uh, to see some really good bush. Great. And 
Luke just said, thank Pete. Um, and he said he would love to have you back at our school uh, if you ever get the chance and you've made a massive impact on a lot of kids and especially our kids with additional needs. Thanks, <laughs> Thank Luke. you. I mean, uh, how about next year when all the lockdowns and everything's done? I'd love to come back to Cranbrook. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you weren't Cranbrook. Okay. Cambridge Park. Cambridge Gardens. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and Kathy has just said, thanks for your answer, re frogs, Tom. Um, my friends and I are curious to observe wildlife interacting with fungi and mycelium networks too. And I'm wondering if you know of any good spots or tips. Oh, can you wait there one sec? Just coincidentally, one sec. All right, I'm a little bit of a fungophile and a microphile. I know you can't really see that, but that was a weevil that was taken over by a uh, fungus. And then amazingly, I had wasps come out of it. And I found that on the Cumberland Plain. I know I'm not answering the question. I'm just um, signaling what I've got because I'm as much of a nerd. <laughs> and this is a huntsman I found in a rainforest that's been taken over uh, by and entomopathogenic fungi as well. Where can you where can you see that stuff? Oh, if I could. Well, one, I mean, not trying to advocate for myself here, but I do find a lot of it when I do my walks, and there's ways to find it. So, really moist areas down near creeks. I had some great experiences this year uh, in uh, near the back of uh, Pent Hills and Darling Mills Creek on the privet. Amazing huntsmen that were just completely colonized with fungi shooting out of all their joints of their legs you find it down near creeks you find it sometimes in caves and moist spots uh, where i was running one of my glowworm walks uh, in there i had katydids the same thing fungi erupting over it look for moist cool areas under overhangs after lots of heavy rain like we had this earlier this year that's where you're going to find them uh, and if you ever want me to take you on a private walk to show you i'm happy to do that in the mountains never that i can guarantee fungi but you do see them Autumn's good. Great. And Bronwyn just said Bronwyn was asking about the geckos before she said thank you. Um, her mum will be happy um, that, that Bronwyn believes her now that there are geckos. There are geckos, <laughs> definitely. And I didn't say one gecko, Bronwyn. Uh, potentially, there could have been an Asian house gecko come down in a cardboard box, which is a little gecko. They're invasive. In fact, they're found pretty much around the world through cargo um, and might be one of them. Tell her, ask her mum if she can get a photo. Uh, Bronwyn, please get your mum to get a photo. Mm -hmm. Throw it up on iNaturalist. It's an app. I don't have my phone on me, but um, yeah, you'd be you'd be able to find it through that. iNaturalist is Bronwyn uh, is a is a great uh, great resource to have, and it's a good app on the phone. Pop a photo in, it GPS tags it, and people there's a bunch of amateurs and experts and enthusiasts that'll get back to you too, real quick and tell you what it is. Yeah, that's a good app, isn't it, Tom? So yeah, if you see plants or animals, you can photograph it. And then, yeah, as Tom said, there's a whole bunch of people on there that will, can identify it for you. I can put the link in, um, yeah, when I send the email. Um, all right, Sheldry said, thank you. And Sandra as well. Um, and Sheldry's also just asked, where can I learn more about frogs in Wollongong? Um, there's some great books. I'm in my, if you bear with me, I'll just show you a book. I think it's pretty good. I mean, you can go, I'm back. You can go full crazy, full crazy nerd and get those sort of books. They're a bit too hard. This is a good book though. Yeah. Marion's book's great. Um, but the book I would start off with, something like this, just Frogs of Australia. Really nice, simple book, Australian Geographic. Um, that's a good start. It will direct you to the frogs of your area. But if you've got a smartphone, by far the best thing you could do, um, there's this Frog ID app. It's free. It's the, one of the largest citizen science projects in the world. It's, a, it's run by the Australian Museum, uh, by Jodie Rowley. And, and, and the rest of her team. It's fantastic. It's got so much information. You can go out there and record frogs in your local area on the app in real time. And when you do that, it also comes up with some of the species that are in your area. So Frog ID app is 
exactly what I'd be going with for, for that. And it's free, you don't need to go buy a book. Okay. Ooh. And then Louisa has just said, apart from walks and talks with kids as a way to encourage vitamin N, what other activities do you or your colleagues either facilitate yourselves or suggest for young people? Um, Louise is based near our Royal National Park um, and would like to see more art and craft based nature activities offered to local kids. Okay. Things like so, um, I think. Sinotypes, printmaking. Uh, sorry, Bron, I cut you off. Uh, I think for me, and this is a couple of things. I think once you've given kids the basis, so uh, I start. I start on my walks off and go, once I've done this tonight, you don't need to come, another, come to another one of my walks. I want you to do this on your own. So I think it's setting kids up to go and do this on their own is really key. Get them out into nature and just be respectful and, and try to show kids how to be respectful and how to be safe, but not fearful. I think fear is the key thing that we don't want to instill respect. Uh, I mean, <laughs> for me, it was playing with just the dirt diggers making boats in the stream and, and going down to a, when let's say even when the gutters are flowing just making out of uh, leaves little boats and sending them rushing down in the water going the storm water as long as obviously it's not a dangerous culvert um yeah getting them out with their cameras printing with as you say printing with leaves onto material or onto paper or um with kids i like uh making uh and I do this with supervision and I think we underestimate the, the capability that kids can understand things. So when it's autumn, the mushrooms are all out, you know, all these different types of fungi, you can still touch fungi as long as you just said, kids, you can't eat this. It's, you know, don't eat anything you don't know. But you can actually touch them and put them on paper and they will leave prints. And I think that's a great art form and that opens up a whole new realm of things to talk about. Building the cubbies and those things um, are great. But I think the unstructured stuff, maybe in a corner in your backyard. Go get a heap of bark and sticks and let your kids build their own, you know, A-frame uh, bush shelter or, or you know, ganya, you know, get them out there and just leave them. Um, we do too much. And I know this sounds ridiculous considering I'm the person taking people on walks, but we do too much prescriptive play with kids. It's good for them just to go and do it. Uh, without a big adult looking over and going, you got to do like this and taking it over. Um, you know, the photography, the cyanotypes, I'm actually not sure what that means, I'm sorry. Uh, and, but yeah, I think that unprescriptive stuff's really key. It's about just giving the kids the, the space to work and play and let them just do it. Sorry, Bron, I can't hear Bron. Yeah, great, that's good. Um, and then just one final comment from Bronwyn again. She said, thank you for sharing your passion um, and for persevering uh, with a few IT hiccups at the beginning. <laughs> so please include a link to um, Tom's iNaturalist profile too. So yeah. No worries. I don't, um, I don't have a lot right. of iNaturalist, but I should do. So, yeah. mm -hmm. All right, so thanks again, Tom. That was really awesome. Um, and yeah, speaking of the iNaturalist, so as I said, the video, this is being um, recorded, so I'll send it out to everyone who registered. Uh, yes, do you record your, all your talks? <laughs> uh, Great if you're in we've recorded all of our webinars, um, so they're going to be sent through um, to everyone that's registered. Um, and it, it'll include some of the links to the information that we've spoken about tonight. There's a um, of links there too okay. about creating habitat as well, Bronwyn. Okay. I've, in my, one of my slides, I've got a lot of links to talks yep. uh, that I've got, uh, talk, or videos that I've done that might be useful. Yeah, and so Tom has got a lot of recorded videos and things as well, so we can include those links um, in that email. Yeah? Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. great. All right. So yeah, thanks everybody for joining us and thanks so much again, Tom. Um, so as I said, yeah, with Greater Sydney Land Care, um, we're also planting a lot of trees. So we're getting out in nature and it's another opportunity to go out and you know, see what you can find in the environment. Um, so stay tuned. We're gonna be back out planting trees
probably at the beginning of next year. Um, so you can check our website, greatersydneymancare.org, um, or check our Facebook and Instagram um, for different events that come up in the future. All right. So thanks very much. And we'll catch you yes, again. Thanks. I really appreciate you bearing with me, um, especially the IT, and uh, stay hooked on nature. Yeah, thanks, Tom. <laughs> Cheers. Good night. Good night.